The Eating Houses by George C. Foster from New York in Slices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eating Houses by George C. Foster. LibriVox Coffee Break Collection Number Six. Beef steak and tater vegetable number twenty. In gin hard and sparrow grass number sixteen. Waiter, waiter, waiter. Coming, sir, while the rascal's going as fast as he can. Is that beef killed for my porterhouse steak I ordered last week? Ready in a minute, sir. Coming, sir. Directly, sir. Two and sixpence, bile demand cabbage, shillin'. Rice pudding, sixpence, eighteen pence. At the bar, if you please. Lobster sauce, salmon, number four. Yes, sir. Imagine a continuous stream of such sounds as these, about the size of the Croton River, flowing through the banks of clattering plates and clashing knives and forks, perfumed with the steam from a mammoth kitchen, roasting, boiling, baking, frying beneath the floor. Crowds of animals with a pair of jaws apiece, wagging an emulation of the one wielded with such terrific effect by Samson, and the thermometer which has become ashamed of itself and hides away behind a mountain of hats in the corner, melting up by degrees to boiling heat, and you will have some notion of a New York eating house. We once undertook to count these establishments in the lower part of the city, but got surfeited on the smell of fried grease before we got half through the first street and were obliged to go home in a cab. We believe, however, that there can't be less than a hundred of them within half a mile of the exchange. They are too important a slice of New York to be overlooked, and strangers who stop curiosity hunting after they have climbed the big clock case at the head of Wall Street haven't seen half the sights. A New York eating house at high tide is a scene which would well repay the labors of an antiquarian or a panoramist if its spirit and details could be but half preserved. Everything is done differently in New York from anywhere else, but in eating the difference is more striking than in any other branch of human economy. A thoroughbred diner downtown will look at a bill of fare, order his dinner, bolt it and himself, and be engaged in putting off a lot of goods upon a greenhorn while you are getting your napkin fixed over your nankins, we think the cotton article preferable, and deciding whether you will take oxtail or mock turtle. A regular downtowner surveys the kitchen with his nose as he comes upstairs, selects his dish by intuition, and swallows it by steam and the electro-galvanic battery. As to digesting it, that is none of his business. He has paid all liabilities to his stomach, and that is all he knows or cares about the matter. The stomach must manage its own affairs. He is not in that line. Not less than 30,000 persons engaged in mercantile or financial affairs dine at eating houses every day. The work commences punctually at 12, and from that hour until 3 or 4 the havoc is immense and incessant. Taylor at Buena Vista was nothing to it. They sweep up everything. Not a fragment is left. The fare is generally bad enough not nearly equal to that which the cook at the home above Bleecker saves for the beggars, generally her own thirteen cousins just come over. It is really wonderful how men of refined tastes and pampered habits, who at home are as fastidious as luxury and a delicate appetite can make them, find it in their hearts or stomachs either to gorge such disgusting masses of stringy meat and tepid vegetables, and to go about their business again under the fond delusion that they have dined. But custom, they say, does wonders, and it seems that the fear of losing it makes our merchant princes willing to put up with and put down warm swill in lieu of soup, 
perspiring joints for delicate entrees, and cornmeal and molasses instead of meringue a la creme a la rose. There are three distinct classes of eating houses, and each has its model or type. Linnaeus would probably classify them as Sweeneyorum, Brownivorous, and Delmonican. The Sweeneyorum is but an extension downward of the Brownivorous, which we have already described. The chief difference to be noted between the two is that while at Brown's the waiters actually do pass by you within hail now and then, at Sweeney's no such phenomenon ever by any possibility occurs. The room is laid out like the floor of a church, with tables and benches for four in place of pews. Along the aisles, of grease if you judge by the smell, are ranged at stated intervals the attentive waiters, who receive the dishes, small plate sixpence, large plate shillin', as they are cut off by the man at the helm, and distribute them on either side with surprising dexterity and precision. Sometimes a nice bit of rose goose, tender, may be seen flying down the aisle without its original wings, followed closely in playful sport by a small plate bile beef vegetables, until both arrive at their destination. When Goose leaps lightly in front of a poet of the Sunday press, who ordered it probably through a commendable preference for a brother of the quill, while the fat and lazy beef dumps itself down with perfect resignation before the monstrous jaws of one of the boys, who has just come from a fire in 49th Street and is hungry some. At Brown's we get a bill of fare with the extras all honestly marked off and priced at the margin. But at Sweeney's we save our sixpence and dispense with superfluities. The bill of fare is delivered by a man at the door, regularly engaged for that purpose, and is as follows. Bild Laman Caperzors, Rose Beef, Rose Goose, Rose Mutton and Taters. Bile demand cabbage, vegetables. Walk in, sir. Take a seat, sir. This is certainly clear and distinct as General Taylor's political opinions, and does away with a great deal of lying in print to which bills of fare as well as newspapers are too much addicted. The Sweeney, or Sixpenny Cut, is frequented by a more diversified set of customers than either of the others. It is not impossible to see here Professor Bush dining cheek by jowl with a hot man off duty, nor to find a black leg from Park Row seated opposite the police officer whose manifest destiny it will be one of these days, to take him to quad unless he should happen to have money enough about him to pay for being let go. The editor, the author, the young lawyer, the publisher, the ice cream man round the corner, the poor physician on his way to patients who don't pay, the young student of divinity learning humility at six shillings a week, the journeyman printer on a batter and afraid to go home to his wife before he gets sober. In short, all classes who go to make up the great middle stripe of population concentrate and commingle at Sweeney's. Yet all these varied elements never effervesce into anything in the slightest degree resembling a disturbance, for eating is a serious business, especially when you have but six pence and no idea whether the next one has been coined. It is true that Sweeney's is emphatically a sixpenny eating house, but you must take care what you are about or you may as well have dined at the Astor. Unless you know how it is done, you will be nicely done yourself. If you indulge in a second piece of bread, a pickle, a bit of cheese, etc., etc., your bill will be summed up to you something after this fashion. Clam soup, sixpence, roast beef large, shillin, roast chicken, eighteen, extra bread, three, butter, sixpence, pickle, sixpence, puddin', sixpence, cheese, three, Claret, 
logwood and water alumized two shillin, seven shillin. If you wish to dine cheaply, be contented with a cheap dinner. Call simply for a small plate of roast beef mixed. This means mashed turnips and potatoes in equal quantities. After you have eaten this frugal dish, and it is as much as anyone really needs for dinner, you may send for bread hard, drink a tumbler of cool croton, pay one shilling for the whole, and go about your business like a refreshed and sensible man. There is still another class of eating houses which deserve honorable mention, the cake and coffee shops, of which Butter Cake Dick's is a favorite sample. The chief merit of these establishments is that they are kept open all night, and that hungry editors or belated idlers can get a plate of biscuits with a lump of butter in the belly for three cents, and a cup of coffee for as much more, or he can regale himself on pumpkin pie at four cents the quarter section with a cup of croton fresh from the hydrant gratis. The principal supporters of these luxurious establishments, however, are the firemen and the upper circles of the newsboys, who have made good business during the day, or have succeeded in pummeling some smaller boy and taking his pennies from him. Here, ranged on wooden benches, the butter cakes and coffee spread ostentatiously before them, and their intelligent faces supported in the crotch of their joined hands. These autocrats of the press and the boys discuss the grave questions as to whether 14 was at the fire in Front Street first or whether it is all gas. Here also are decided in advance the relative merits and speed of the boats entered for the next regatta, and points of great pith and moment in the science of the ring are definitively settled. As midnight comes and passes, the firemen, those children of the dark, gather from unimaginable places, and soon a panorama of red shirts and brown faces lines the walls and fills the whole area of the little cellar. They are generally far more moderate than politicians and less noisy than gentlemen. At the first tingle of the fire bell, they leap like crouching greyhounds, and are in an instant darting through the street towards their respective engine houses, whence they emerge dragging their ponderous machines behind them, ready to work like titans all night and all day, exposing themselves to every peril of life and limb, and performing incredible feats of daring strength, to save the property of people who know nothing about them, care nothing for them, and perhaps will scarcely take the trouble to thank them. But of all this by itself. The type of eating house of which we have not spoken is the expensive and aristocratic restaurant, of which Delmonico's is the only complete specimen in the United States. And this, we have it on the authority of traveled epicures, is equal in every respect in its appointments and attendance, as well as the quality and execution of its dishes, to any similar establishment in Paris itself. We have not left ourselves room in this number to speak in detail of this famous restaurant, nor of its habitués. It well deserves, however, a separate notice, and a look through its well-filled yet not crowded saloons, and into its admirable cuisine will enable us to pass an hour very profitably. Besides obtaining a dinner which, as a work of art, ranks with a picture by Huntingdon, a poem by Willis, or a statue by Powers. A dinner which is not merely a quantity of food deposited in the stomach, but is, in every sense and to all the senses, a great work of art. End of The Eating Houses by George G. Foster